small spaces. 11. The last thing before the sixth grade went home was to stand in line to have their pictures taken in the middle of a group of three scarecrows. Ollie lined up with everyone else, but she was almost bouncing with impatience. She wanted so badly to read, it felt like her book was burning a hole in her backpack. Mr. Easton looked happy. The sun was vivid now, the clouds had all burned away. They had spent the whole day at the farm, and, except for Coco's chin, the trip had gone pretty well. The bus driver was still hanging around. He eyed the sixth grade as though he were picking out which chicken to chop for dinner. Ollie thought. Mr. Easton tried to make small talk. A lot of scarecrows you've got here, he said. Where'd you find the time to make so many? Ollie hadn't thought of that. She wondered if there were other farm workers they hadn't seen. How many people did it take to run a farm? They were already here, said the bus driver. The scarecrows, said Mr. Easton. Where'd they come from? Here, said the bus driver again, all here. Now he was looking over Mr. Easton's shoulder straight at Ollie. She wanted to slink away. Eyes open, just ready to be stood up. Mr. Easton looked interested. They are in such good condition, he said. I wonder how old they are. The bus driver just shrugged and smiled. He was still looking at Ollie. Old enough, he said. Old enough. The clouds were filling in as the sun slanted west. Twilight had arrived by the time the sixth grade piled into the steamy bus. There was much less noise than that morning. Lunch and horses, milking cows and photos had worn them out. It was good to meet you, Olivia, Seth said. You too, said Ollie. She didn't even correct him when he called her Olivia. She thought of telling him everything, asking him if he knew what Ms. Webster was afraid of. Mr. Seth, she began. But Mr. Easton broke in. On the bus, he called. Hurry up, got to get to school by pickup time. Ollie hesitated, torn, and then Seth had already turned toward the main barn, whistling again. He gave Ollie a last thoughtful glance over his shoulder. Ollie climbed onto the bus. Miss Webster watched them go from the gravel driveway. As the sun hid behind clouds, the cheery expression seemed to leech out of her face, leaving it gray and old, exhausted. She looked just like she had crying by the creek, except that this time her eyes were dry, her face hard. The black cat, his name's Behemoth, Seth had told her when Ollie asked, making her laugh, sat behind Ms. Webster. His tail was curled neatly about his feet, his eyes bright in the gathering dusk. Ollie sank down in her seat, ready to go home to the egg. Hopefully Dad was making something yummy, lasagna or his famous cornbread mole squash pot pie. Ollie, to make up for yesterday, would eat every bite. Then she would finish small spaces downstairs by the wood stove with a mug of hot chocolate. Once she finished, she would tell her dad about the farm mystery. He would be intrigued. They would pass theories back and forth. She would even laugh at his jokes. Coco Zintner kept trying to apologize. Ollie ignored her. Coco tried one last time on the bus. Hey, Ollie, she said. Ollie, I... Ollie, tired and at the end of her temper, was about to say something she would have regretted, but Mr. Easton saved her. Come on, he called. Get in your seats, all of you. We're moving out. Coco sat down looking unhappy. The engine roared. The bus started off. Ollie took the seat next to Brian again. She wondered what Brian, who quoted Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, would think about the mystery of Misty Valley and small spaces. She didn't know what to think of it herself. She opened her book. Three nights later, Jonathan disappeared. 
He had made a will. The farm was mine for my lifetime and our children's after I was gone. The farm I now leave to you, Margaret, my dearest daughter. He also left me a letter. Do not try to find me, he wrote. I love you. I am sorry. But we searched. Of course we searched. We found nothing. After a week after his brother's disappearance, Caleb came to me. I know where John is, he said. I know what you're thinking, I said, but the smiling man isn't real. John just made him up. He was frightened and he felt guilty and made him up. But even as I said it, I didn't believe it, and Caleb knew I didn't. The smiling man pulled me out of the river, said Caleb. I can't remember anything else from that night, but I remember his hands on mine, and mine were blue, Caleb paused. Jonathan's not gone, you know. At night I can hear his footsteps. Caleb swallowed. I can go to him. I can go to where he is, so John won't be alone. I shouldn't have said it. My dear Margaret, I shouldn't have. But I did. Go to him then, madman, I spat. If you think you can, don't come back. It is your fault he is gone. Caleb wasn't angry. He stood silent a moment, then he bent and whispered in my ear, until the mist becomes rain. Then he was gone. I never saw Caleb or Jonathan again. Something changed in the quality of the noise of the bus. Ollie looked up from her book, frowning. The shouting had dropped, and even the monotonous urging from Mr. Easton to sit down, please, and be quiet seemed different, distracted, puzzled. Ollie looked out the window, peering around Brian. A heavy fog had descended on the road, the black tops of trees poking up like drowning fingers. The left side of the forest road was forest. On the right, the cornfields stretched out, guarding guarded by scowling scare truck crows. The mist was so dense that it threw the headlights back into her eyes. The bus was rolling along at a crawl. Ollie's hand tightened involuntarily on her book. There were mutters all around, nervous, giggling. So weird. Look at that fog. I have to pee. The bus was crawling slower and slower. The mist thickened. Ollie didn't recognize where they were. She didn't even know how long they'd been driving. She stared out the window. When the mist rises. But the year wasn't turning. Also, her book was just a story. They drifted to a halt. The bus coughed and died. For a moment, total silence. Then, a burst of noise. I think the bus broke down! I want to go home. We're lost, yelled Mike Campbell, even though that was stupid. How could they be lost? Ollie was still staring out the window. The yellow autumn trees had turned black and spindly, as though winter had come in in the last three minutes. The broad, smooth country road had become an old, cracked ribbon, running away and vanishing into the trees still lapped in mist. Where were they? Slowly, the bus driver stood up. The shouting died away. The driver turned around. He seemed to have gotten both taller and wider. Well, said the driver, surveying them, best get moving. At nightfall, they'll come for the rest of you. Then he smiled, tongue flicking red against his teeth.